Okay, now let's look at how a barometer works. What's a barometer? A barometer is a device that measures the pressure, in particular air pressure. Um, the way a barometer works has to do with the variation of depth, uh, with variation of pressure due to the depth inside a fluid. What we can do is imagine we got a fluid, say water. Uh, we take a tube that's open at one end. And that tube is also evacuated, which means there is no air trapped inside. Okay, it's vacuum inside. And what we do is we thrust the tube face down, okay, so that the opening is now below water. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, you know, there is no air inside, so there's no air pressure inside. It's just vacuum, right? On the other hand, outside, we get a pressure coming from the air. I suppose this distance is very short, so we don't have to worry about the extra pressure of, of fluid, whatever. Uh, you got air pressure coming down, PA, 1 atm. This pressure will push the fluid up this way because there is no pressure inside. Remember, it's a vacuum. So as a result, the fluid level is going to go up. Okay, it's going to go up. Say the fluid is going to go up to here and then stop. Where does it stop? What is the height? h that it's going to reach before it can actually stop well the idea is that uh, you have to achieve a balance of pressure you know the pressure here is the air pressure and the pressure there inside the tube is due to the fluid pressure pushing down and these two pressures must be the same otherwise if this pressure is too low then the air pressure will push it further up and if this pressure is too high, then it's going to push the fluid out, which means the fluid level is going to go down. Okay, if the fluid level reaches a certain height so that inside and out pressure is the same, then H will not change anymore. So basically what we do is we let us equate the air pressure outside with the pressure of the fluid inside. Now we know the pressure of the fluid inside is rho GH. Here I use the subscript F to denote that this is the density of the fluid inside. Okay, that is the pressure due to the fluid that's pushing down here. That equals the air pressure outside. Okay, so let us equate this with the air pressure outside. This allows us to find the value H, which is the height of the fluid column. Okay, so H equals to PA over rho fluid G. Uh, this is one ATM. It's about 100,000 pascals. G is also fixed, 10.8 meters per second squared. So the height of the, of the fluid column inside of the barometer, it really depends on the density of the fluid. What if I use water, a very common liquid? Uh, the density of the fluid in this case is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, and we can find H. As a matter of fact, we already did that. Uh, and we, what we found was that if it's water, then H equals to 10.3 meters, right, for 1 atm. Of course, if the pressure of the air is a little bit lower than that, then uh, H will be a little bit lower. If it's higher, then it will be more than 10.3. So you see, I can use the height of the water column to figure out the air pressure outside. This is basically how a barometer works. You measure this height and convert that to the air pressure. Okay, you measure this H, you know the density of the fluid, you know G, you can find the air pressure outside. Um, there is one problem here, and that is, this is a fairly large number. This is about 32 feet. I mean, you're talking about something like two, three stories. Okay, so that's a giant barometer. It's not certainly compact. You cannot put fit it under a roof. It's too large. You know, in fact, in the old days, in some old buildings, they actually had, um, on the side of the building, they had, you know, structures like that, actually, you know, a few stories tall with water inside, and the water level would go up and down, and they can u they actually use that to figure out the air pressure. Of course, how do you, why do you have to know the air pressure? Because it has to do with uh, weather forecasting, you know, the air pressure can, can serve as an indicator whether it's going to rain or not. So anyhow, that is water-based parameter and the problem with that is that it's too big okay now how do you reduce the size of the parameter what you need to do is to make h smaller 
And since you cannot control the air pressure, you cannot control G, the only thing you can control is what kind of fluid we use, right? Okay, you can see here, the denser the fluid, the lower the value of H. Okay, so if you want to design a very compact barometer, we want to use a very dense liquid. And what is the densest common liquid we can think of? Well, mercury comes to mind, okay? What is the density of mercury? Okay, rho mercury is 13.6, that of water, okay? It's 13.6 grams per milliliter instead of one gram per milliliter. So if you replace water with mercury, then this rho increases by a factor of 13.6, which means what you can do is take that 10.3 meters and you divide this by 13.6. Okay, let's do the algebra. 10.3 divided by 13.6. And what do we get? We get about 760 millimeters or 76 centimeters, roughly speaking. Okay. That is not too bad. That's only three, about three quarters of a meter, which is very much manageable. So you can use mercury instead of water because of the high density of mercury. You can make a barometer into a compact size. You know, the, the height of this uh, mercury column is only about three quarters of a meter. Okay, so that's how a barometer works. And we typically use mercury instead of water. Um, speaking of mercury, you know, a mercury column of the height around 760 millimeters can support about 1 atm of air pressure. In other words, if you have mercury column with the height of 760 millimeters, at the bottom of this column, the pressure produced by this mercury column is about equal to 1 atm, which is 100,000 pascals. For this reason, we can introduce a new unit for pressure and that is called millimeter Hg. What is a millimeter Hg? A millimeter Hg is the pressure produced by one millimeter of mercury column. Okay, how much is the millimeter Hg? Well, let's just put it this way. 760 millimeter Hg is equivalent to about 100,000 pascals. Okay, so we, you can do the conversion this way. If you want to calculate the exact value of a millimeter Hg in Pascal, which is standard unit, all you have to do is use rho gh, and rho is the density of mercury, g is the acceleration of gravity, and h, of course, is one millimeters, okay, or one thousandth of a meter. This is not the only alternative unit for pressure besides Pascal. As a matter of fact, when it comes to the unit of pressure, or the units of pressure, here's the thing. I don't know of any other common physical quantity with so many different units that are being used concurrently today. Here is a partial list of some of the common units we use for pressure. Okay, Pascal, that is a Newton per meter squared. That is the SI standard unit. You notice that this is a very small unit because a Newton is nothing, right? I mean, it's just about one fifth of a pound and you distribute only one fifth of a pound over a fairly large area of a meter by a meter, you get a Pascal. So Pascal is a fairly small unit, okay? When it comes to air pressure, it's a lot more than one Pascal. In fact, standard air pressure at the sea level, uh, one ATM, it's called one ATM, is to four six figures, 1.013 times 10 to the five Pascals. It's about 100,000 Pascals, as we know. And as we learned, it is also equivalent to 760 millimeter Hg, okay? So you have a mercury column of 760 millimeters, you can balance the air pressure outside. Now, 760 millimeters, you can convert that to inches, right? Because, you know, one millimeter, one millimeter is one-tenth of a centimeter, and every inch is 2.45 centimeters. You can make that conversion. It turns out to be about 29.9 inches. Okay, so we have also a different unit called inches Hg instead of millimeter Hg. Uh, this is to say that to support one atm of air pressure, you need a mercury column of the height of 29.9 inches. That's actually the same as 760 millimeters. Okay, 
This is a unit, inches HG. It's an implied unit that we use for weather forecasting here in the US because we use inches instead of millimeters. So when you listen to weather forecast, okay, sometimes you hear they talk about uh, pressure. They say the pressure today is at 28.7 and rising. Uh, what the heck does that mean? What does that 28.7 mean? It means 28.7 inches of mercury. Okay, that's what it means. So we have so far, we get Pascal, we get ATM, we get uh, millimeter G or inches HG. But that's not all. There's another unit we use pretty often. That's T-O-R-R. -R. Okay, now that is named after the Italian physicist Torricelli. What is one T-O-R-R -R or TOR? That is one millimeter HG. Okay, it's just a different name. And even that is not all. Because there is yet another unit which we use here very often in this country based on the British system. You know, uh, uh, pressure is force over area, right? If we use pounds, that's a very common unit for force in the British system, and we use for area instead of using meter square, that's SI, right? Why don't we use square inches, okay? So we have pounds per square inches. Pounds per square inches. In other words, PSI, okay, pounds per square inches. That is yet another unit, right? Okay, how do we convert the air pressure to PSI, or pounds per square inches? Well, all you have to do is to take this many pascals, right? And that's Newton per meter squared, right? Convert Newton to pounds and convert square meters to square inches. And what you get is 14.7 PSI, okay? Think about it, that's quite a lot. Every square inch, which is not much, right? You have pressure from the air in the amount of 14.7 pounds. That's quite a bit. So air pressure is actually pretty high. So PSI is yet another unit. Okay, and just when you think there's, there are too many, there's one more we use pretty common, it's called bar. One bar is defined to be exactly 100,000 pascals. Okay, so a standard air pressure is slightly more than one bar, okay, because it's 1.013 instead of one times 10 to the five pascals. Uh, that is a fairly large unit because it's 100,000 pascals. So we typically use millibar, that is a thousandth of one bar, okay. So we have all kinds of strange units that we use, but of course, make sure you understand what Pascal means. That's the primary unit that we use in SI system for pressure. All right. There are three principles that we learn in this chapter based on the mechanics of fluid. They're all extremely useful. In fact, they play vital roles in industrial revolution and in human civilization. One is the, the so-called Pascal's principle, you know, Pascal, he was the French physicist whose name is being used for pressure. Pascal's principle. The Pascal's principle, which we'll learn in just a minute, is the cardinal principle behind all hydraulic systems. You know what a hydraulic system is, right? Use fluid uh, so that you can build a system when you input a small amount of force, you get a very large amount of force coming out, so you can control something very heavy using a smaller amount of force. So that's called Pascal's principle. It is used to build hydraulic systems. Another common principle is called Archimedes' principle. Now, that is ancient, okay? It is named after a Greek scholar by the name of Archimedes. He taught us how much force is exerted on an object when it's submerged in water. Okay, there is a force of the water pushing the thing up. Uh, what do we call that force now? As we know, it's called the buoyant force. Okay, what is Archimedes principles used for? Well, how about building ships? You know, right? Because you want to build ships, you don't want this thing to sink, right? You want to figure out just how much cargo it can carry. And uh, then you have to figure out how much force the water can give to support the weight of the ship plus its cargo. So that's called the Archimedes principle. We can also learn that. So that's the cardinal principle of shipbuilding. Okay. Both of these principles are based on the statics of fluid. And that is, we do not necessarily need the fluid to flow. Okay. It's static. Nothing is moving. And when the fluid actually flows with something in addition to that, with something new, it's called Bernoulli's principle. The Bernoulli's principle is also very useful. 
the primary application of Bernoulli's principle is fixed wing airplanes. Okay, how does the airplane fly? It's because of the Bernoulli's principle. So when you design an airplane, you're going to have to use the Bernoulli's principle. Okay, so that's a lot to learn. So these are three of the most important principles in fluid mechanics. Let's look at our very first one, the so-called Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle, what does it say? Well, it says that if we have a sealed system of fluid, okay, from here to there, I'm using an example of an uneven U-shaped object, okay. This is an arm, here's another arm, the whole thing is shaped like a U. So what I do is I'm going to fill it up with a certain type of fluid, okay. So this all fluid. And I make sure that this system is sealed so the fluid does not leak, okay. It cannot come out of anywhere. What does the Pascal's principle say? The Pascal's principle says that if you look at this sealed region of fluid, then if there is a certain increase or decrease of pressure somewhere, okay, anywhere, that change in pressure will be felt throughout the entire system, okay, throughout the entire system. Uh, let's look at how this works. For example, uh, if you look at this region here, let's imagine there is a little area here. Okay, This area receives a pressure from the left and also a pressure from the right. right? And these two pressures must balance, otherwise the thing is going to move. Okay, I'm assuming that everything is balanced, so it doesn't move. So these two pressures must be the same. Now, imagine if I apply a force here, okay, I apply an additional force. Uh, let's call this force F1, okay. That force is applied evenly over this piston, which seals off the fluid, and this piston has an area A1. Okay, so what additional pressure does this extra force provide? That would be P1 equals F1 over A1, of course. There is an additional pressure, P1, right? So the pressure is a little greater by an amount, P1. Well, this thing is going to lose balance unless the other side must also come up with this additional pressure, which is also equal to P1. So what does that mean? It means that the other side must come up with the same pressure to balance it. And this tells us that as you push this piston down, the other side will have to rise because uh, you have to have an additional pressure. And how do you keep it from losing the balance, well, you must have another force F2 here, which is applied over a larger area piston A2, such that F2 over A2, that is the additional pressure coming down this way, equals P1, okay? So that's P2, that is the additional pressure due to the force here. So in order to keep balance, F1 and F2 are not necessarily the same. Rather, the pressure produced by F1 and the pressure produced by F2, okay, the extra pressures from the left and from right will have to be equal so that the fluid remains in equilibrium. Okay, so if you equate these two, you get F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. That is an application of Pascal's principle. Now, if I figure out what F2 is, I find F2 equals F1 times this ratio, right, which is A2 over A1. Now, when I design this hydraulic system, my job is to make sure that if I use a much, a, a very small force, I can produce a much greater force. For example, I push this down with only a few pounds of force. Over here, I want to lift an entire automobile up, okay? How do I achieve that? Well, no problem. Just, I just want to make sure that F2 is far greater than F1, right? How do you do that? Very simple. Just make A2 far greater than A1. So I have a very small area over there. I have a very large area. Okay, so that's how you can use a very small force and lift something much, much heavier. That's how a hydraulic system works. Okay, we must also understand that this device allows us to 
push something very heavy using a much smaller force. You saved force. There's no question about that. It doesn't mean you can save energy. Okay. Conservation of energy says no matter what you do, you never get more energy from here than you put in there. As a matter of fact, how much work does this force do to push it down? Let's say it moves by a certain distance, which I call x1. Okay. How much work is done now? The work done, isn't that equal to f1, x1? Right? Now, meanwhile, as this cylinder goes down, that cylinder will have to go up because assume the fluid is not compressible, so the total volume of the fluid remains the same. So this guy goes up by distance x2. How much work is done if, if by the fluid, if the fluid pushes the cylinder up with a force f2 by distance x2? Well, that would be equal to f2, x2, right? I can show you that these two are actually the same. Okay, assuming there's no friction, no viscosity, nothing like that, under ideal circumstances. The work that you do here equals the work done by the fluid pushing this piston up. How do I show that? Well, simple. Because, after all, the volume of the fluid that you displace here equals the volume gained on the other side. Because, after all, the, you know, the fluid cannot, uh, cannot uh, um, change its volume, right? So I have A1, X1 equals a2 x2 right uh, so what is f1 x1 anyway f1 x1 okay let me write down f1 in terms of f2 and x1 in terms of x2 let's do that okay first of all uh f1 equals okay look at this what's f1 equal to f1 equals to f2 times a factor of a1 over a2 right and then x1. What's x1? Look at this. x1 equals a2 x2. Okay. a2 x2 over a1, right? All right. You cross out a1 a2 and a2 a1. What do you get? You get f2 x2. That is the requirement of the conservation of energy. Okay, there's nothing we can do about that, which means the work that you put in equals the work you get out from the other side. Assuming that no energy is wasted through friction, through heat, nothing like that, under ideal circumstances. So you can save force, but not energy. Okay, 